I love a good single player game. I love playing a narrative, a puzzle, a story, all of that. And I play a ton of them. So that means I have a bit of a wish list of some pretty practical things as well as maybe some that might be a little fantastical. But I think as single player gamers, we'd all love to see more of at least something on this list. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Rings, 10 features every single player game should have. Starting off with number 10, immersive alternate animation. Animations. If there's one thing single player games tend to be pretty good at, it's immersion. The thing about immersion is that it's never just one thing that makes a game feel real, it's a whole lot of things. And for this point, we want to focus on some little things that make the game feel like a more realistic, real world. These are the sorts of things you mostly see in big AAA productions that just deliver a level of detail that is kind of only possible with a huge game with a massive budget. Um, if you want a good example we're talking about, uh, look at Black Ops Cold. Cold War. When you talk to your teammate seated at a desk, depending on the location you first talk to her, there's actually completely different animations when she turns to look at you. Those are the kinds of small details we're talking about here. Any other game would just make it so you could only initiate conversation from one angle, and they wouldn't have to create all these custom animations that most people don't even notice, but subconsciously make the game a lot more immersive. Arkham Knight is another game that really takes things to the next level with this. Uh, the different contextual animations you can pull off here are stuff like getting into the Batmobile, changing pretty drastically depending on if you're standing by it, on top of it, if you're gliding, or even dive bombing into it. The animation changes to match that action, and it's so cool. Uh, there's more obvious ones out there too, like stealth games where your character grabs uh, like a weapon, like a, maybe a knife that they've got sheathed somewhere when you're just close enough to perform a kill, or the way characters shift their weight, whether they can or can't grab onto a ledge, and something like Uncharted. They're all really relatively modern minor, but wow, do they make the characters of the game feel more real. And number nine is good cutscene controls. Now, this is a more practical concern. Uh, so many games still have no way to pause during cutscenes. That's ridiculous. And it's less of an issue in games that don't have a lot of cutscenes, but for anything story-driven, you really should be able to do whatever, like especially pausing, skipping, or restarting a cutscene in case you missed something, or need to pee, or it's time to get up and stretch a little bit. The main thing I want to emphasize here is just choice. Anyone who wants to skip a cutscene or dialogue i think you should be able to like maybe you've seen it before and this is kind of a waste of your time but on the flip side anyone who wants to experience a game story as fully as possible you should be able to do that without issues the best possible implementation would be to just make it so you can pause at any time and from there you can make the options like uh, let's skip or if you don't want to go through the trouble of pausing maybe you should be able to just go back to it in the options or even have the option to automatically set up some default action that happens to your preference. Probably one of the most annoying thing about starting a new game is figuring out how cutscenes work. So often, it's a coin flip whether hitting start is going to pause it or just skip the whole scene. And that sucks because it, it leaves a lot of players afraid to touch anything while a movie plays out. What's interesting is if you go back a little ways to the Xbox 360 era, a lot of games then made it very obvious how to skip cutscenes by putting a big flashing skip button. And, and that's how you do it. And you can still see some games that are like that now where they have like a little a button at the bottom corner you hold it down and a little timer goes around the button so you don't do anything by accident and I would love to see more of that it doesn't break immersion when you do it in that more subtle way that we see now but not enough games do it at all a lot of games still just outright screw this up and I don't think it's really asking for a lot just an easy way to pause or skip cutscenes or even restart them and number eight is reactive dialogue and cutscenes, like things you can do in the game that it doesn't tell you to do, but they work anyway, like to go along with the reactive animations. Another thing we'd love to see that's really done in games is when the dialogue or the story changes depending on what you're doing, like without making it obvious this is possible. Like I can remember little times when you could do something that they didn't tell you you could do that was kind of monotonous, but at the same time it would like make me elated. I was like, holy crap. I remember Donkey Kong Country being kind of rife with these things because they really wanted to show off their animation prowess. But like more recently in the final mission of like GTA 5, you're supposed to kill a guy by shooting him with a sniper rifle and it gets followed up in a cutscene. You'd think shooting him with something else would cause the mission to fail, but that's actually not true. The game tells you to use a sniper rifle, but you could use a rocket launcher instead and it actually changes the cutscene. Thank you. 
It's actually kind of amazing that it's developed from doing little dances in Donkey Kong Country to being able to fully change a cutscene by using a different weapon that causes something almost totally different to happen. But GTA 5 is absolutely full of this kind of stuff. A lot of missions are more open than the game tells you they are. And it's really cool when the game acknowledges things that you do in it that aren't necessarily to the specifications that it asked you to do them. It makes it feel more like it's your story rather than a series of disconnected cutscenes that happen between gameplay. And number seven is in-depth mission and level select options. Uh, a pretty big one, uh, but also very practical. Few games have decent level select options, and it's absolutely ridiculous. Like, for whatever reason, it feels like a lot of games are going backwards rather than forwards with this. A lot of the old Assassin's Creed games let you replay missions whenever you want, but like with Origins and everything after it, the only way to replay certain parts of the story is to start the game over. Uh, single player games seem to be getting longer and longer, but if you want to replay any part of them again it's kind of all or nothing and that's weird especially when not every game is terrible about it like the master chief collection lets you play any mission in the game in the series easily and for a lot of them you even have different starting points you can select from in each level which is nice the xbox 360 slash ps3 alone in the dark game it was pretty rough but one thing it did super correctly was the level select options you could skip to any part of the game whenever you want it and it was shown in a movie like timeline it's not necessarily something i I'd want to see in every game but particularly in cinematic games that's a great system um even rpgs i mean th they could be better like tactics ogre on psp had this elaborate story tree that lets you go back to basically anything you could pretty much go to any choice that branched the story and make a different choice which is interesting at times it's a system i wish appeared in more open world or rpg games because honestly like you can kind of do it ad hoc with saves but it'd be really cool if you could just sort to have the option you know it's not necessarily that i would use it all the time i do like to some extent being stuck with my choices and i could easily choose to do that but sometimes i'm just like ah man that sucks it'd be nice to not have to go back to a backed up save but rather use a system that you're allowed to use even if it undoes some of the progress i don't care it's got to be quicker than going through all of the menus to exit the game and reload another save and number six, a proper collectibles map. Another thing, I mean, not a lot of single player games have is consistency about collectibles. A lot of games want you to get them, uh, but not too many of them are very good at keeping track of them. A lot more games need to be like Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga in that it gives you a ton of tools for finding all the collectibles, including a tracker that appears on your HUD. What's even better is that you can freely turn the tracker on and off, so if you're not wanting to hunt down every last collectible, or you're not wanting to do it right now, you can clean up the screen and hide all those distracting markers. Most single player games need to let you make notes on the map too, like exploration games in particular where you have to backtrack to certain spots. They should give you some kind of way of marking the location on your map either with different stickers like breath of the wild which is a pretty good system or just straight up drawing and writing notes on the map like with divinity 2 anything that could make exploring and collectible hunting a little less tedious basically because let's just be completely clear if you were doing that in real life assuming it was possible that's what you'd be doing you'd be writing on the map you'd be making notes otherwise you would never find anything <laughs> And number five, a summary of where you are in the story and what's happened so far. And for some people, time is probably the most precious resource. Free time for gaming is a luxury a lot of people can't afford, whether they're in school or have a job or what have you. I mean, uh, we're, we're not all rich. And the subset of people who are both not rich and lucky enough to play video games as a job is a pretty small subset of people, which I am very lucky to count myself as one. But for a lot of people, it can be weeks or even sometimes months between long-term gaming sessions. For folks like that, it can be really intimidating to get into a big RPG or an open world game, especially if they actually want to be able to follow the plot. That's why having some kind of summary of events when you start at the game is really, really helpful, like a previously on type thing, like what you get out of Witcher 3. We'll talk about that more in a second. It kind of actually allows people to know what's going on, but I, I mean, for people who play games consistently, I could get how it might be a little irritating. So 
it's good when this type of thing is also easy to skip or exists as a journal within like the pause screen or something. But there's not enough games that do it to where it's a legit gripe. Probably the one that does the most admirable job, like I said, is Witcher 3. Even if some of the lines get a little repetitive after a while, it's not a super long thing and you're really able to remember what you're doing and where you are. Another game that does it very well is Yakuza 0 or even some of the other Yakuza games in Judgment where at the beginning of every chapter they give you a summary. I mean, Witcher 3 is not the only game out there that summarizes where you are in the plot, but it's not like a long list. I've read about a ton of people who've restarted games like RDR2 more than once because they have no idea where they are in the story after being away from the game for a couple of months. And for massive games like that, that's super frustrating. At number four, playing completely offline. And yeah, this seems super obvious, but a lot of games somehow struggle with it. It's a single player game with no multiplayer elements at all, but for some reason, you can't play it offline. Like it feels crazy that it even needs to be said, but there are enough single player games with some kind of online required DRM that it actually really needs to be said. One of the benefits of single player games is that you can play them when you're not connected to the internet. And while being connected probably isn't an issue for most people, People, there are places in the world, or let's say means of transportation, say a train or an airplane, where you're just not connected to the internet, at least reliably so, and losing connection means losing access to a huge portion of your game library. Now, I don't think it's worth singling out any game in particular, but if you haven't had to deal with it, you'd probably be surprised by just how many games, with absolutely no multiplayer at all, still require an internet connection to play. It's dumb, pointless, and that's all there is to say. And number three is seamless transition between the map and gameplay. Now with all the improvements made to streaming and loading times, you'd think we'd see a little more innovation in map design, but not really. Most next-gen games display their in-game maps same way they used to, as a flat map in the menu. But we have seen at least one game that feels in a way more seamless in next-gen. Now I'm talking about Driver San Francisco, a game where you can effortlessly switch from first person to a bird's eye view of the entire Bay Area with the press of a button. When you're all the way zoomed out, you can quickly scan the map, select a few races on the fly, and you never have to look at a single menu. It's a cool system that it's kind of shocking no other big open world game has tried it. The closest thing I've seen to it is like Eagle Vision in recent Assassin's Creed games where you zoom out to a literal bird's eye view of the area, but there's not all that much you can do other than identify enemies and mark objectives. Driver San Francisco really, really, really is one of those underrated gems. It had a lot of really good ideas that we wish developers would follow up on. Um, like in an open world game, you look at the map so much. Maybe we could make that process a little less clunky. And number two is console commands and cheats. Like fewer and fewer games really let you break them open and have fun. Obviously, if it's multiplayer, it makes sense to curb cheating. But if it's single player, why does why why do developers care? What's the harm in letting people screw around and turn on God mode and give themselves infinite ammo or whatever? What what does that do? It doesn't ruin other people's gaming, does it? Bethesda seems like one of the few companies that are still kind of holding the banner for this. Like Fallout and Elder Scrolls have extensive console options that let you change pretty much everything about the game. And even more console-friendly games like Doom Eternal have unlockable cheats you can use after beating a level. I'm not picky. Either of those things are good. Cheating can be fun, too. Video games are meant to be fun. They don't all have to be, like, following a distinct set of logic at all times. Like, maybe let us mess around with it. If the concern is that players will cheat to earn achievements and trophies, just disable them when you activate cheats. Like, let's say you cheat. That's when you can no longer get trophies. That's it. It's gone. Wow. There's probably other issues to deal with with this sort of thing but it's still something we'd like to see more of and finally, at number one, unnecessary but little cool interactions and abilities. It's kind of specific, but I love when games give you like a little additional way to interact with the world. Usually it's kind of pointless, but those extra little animations can add just a ton to the game, like the middle finger button in Far Cry Blood Dragon or Symphony of the Night pose you can do when you hold up. Hell, all the crazy little details GTA games have for this as well. Like I can leave the engine of a car running if you just tap the button to exit a vehicle, but 
if you hold it down, you turn the engine off completely. It's such a minor thing, but it makes you feel like you're actually interacting in the world in a small way. It's one of those things that I'm sure a lot of developers don't have the time, money, or energy to implement, but it's something we'd like to see more and wish would pop up more in games. It's probably kind of unrealistic to expect every game to have this level of detail, but if we had our way, uh, they would. Sometimes the little details are just the best ones. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. The best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.